Welcome. I'm Chris Wilson. I'm a developer advocate at Google. And one of my passions is web audio and audio and music in general. So I'm here to chat with Chris Lois, who, among other things, is the editor of the Web Audio Weekly newsletter. So uh, welcome, Chris. Nice to have you here. We're Thanks, Chris. Get to, be in the, get to be in the same place at the same time for once. Um, this is rather nice. So, uh, you know, I have to say, like, first of all, thanks for doing Web Audio Weekly. I think it's a tremendous resource for anyone who's interested in audio on the web and, and music in general, for that matter. Um, I, I think the what I'd start off by asking you is just from what you see coming through Web Audio, uh, what's most exciting today? Like, what do, what do you find most compelling? So, I think the technology has been around it's sort of in its big. It, it's in its infancy at the moment, we could mm -hmm. say, but it's starting to become something that people are relying on and can use across lots of different devices and platforms. So I think there's been a huge early adopter crowd. People who want to build yeah, digital audio workstations <laughs> and modular synthesizers and that kind of thing, and really pushing the boundaries early on, which has been great in the sort of development of the specification and the capabilities. But I think we're starting to see people using the technology to do really interesting things that are not specifically for uh, audio enthusiasts, so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I'm enjoying the the work that um, that people are doing on co like collaborative editing of sheet music and being able to yeah, share the pieces with your definitely. with your bandmates and sort of things that when it's on the web and everyone can just use it and listen to a part and print out their piece for the you know for their orchestra for their band, it's kind of putting all of that technology and software that previously would have been very difficult to. To, to use and install and very expensive, kind of immediately on the web, making yeah. it collaborative and those kind of things. So, Yeah, I think the exciting part for me too is just, as you said, seeing all these things that used to be sort of science experiments now be deliverable on, on the web and on web audio. Uh, you know, several years ago I wrote a, uh, a pitch detect demo. Like I was like, I wonder how hard it is to use web audio to tune my guitar. And it turns out, it's a bit hard, but you know, I, I figured it out eventually, and I, I put this demo together. It wasn't a huge deal. Didn't make a huge deal about it because it, it wasn't particularly well built, but I learned a lot about how tuning works. And um, then last week, one of my, my coworkers, uh, Paul, uh, Paul Lewis, went and built a guitar tuner, which I now have installed on my, my phone. In fact, I last week deleted every other guitar tuner off my phone. And this is what I use to do my guitar tuning with because it just works. I mean, it works like an app, feels like an app, it works offline, et cetera. You know, he followed all the best practices, beautiful interface, and you know, uses uses autocorrelation to figure out the tuning. And I think that the same thing is going to become true of, as you said, sheet music, of you know, all these other little pieces of music that really collaboration is a key feature. And I think the web makes that so much easier. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I've seen some interesting things that the BBC and Al Jazeera have done with tools for journalists mm -hmm. in the field, mm -hmm. where you know you don't have the the time or the space, or, or right. you can't carry all the equipment that you need to set up something. But being able to just open it, record it, do a simple edit, and upload it back to to home is straight on your you know straight right. on your tablet or, or laptop is. You don't need all of the capabilities, perhaps, of a full-blown piece of, you know, Pro Tools like <laughs> uh, I software. Think, but I think for both of us, you know, when we started in in audio, uh, the equipment was a huge amount of of stuff, you know, that you had to carry around with you if you wanted to record uh, in a, a portable system. You had to carry a backpack full of gear. Yeah. And today, you know, most of what you need is in your in your phone or your tablet or whatever device you happen to have in front of you is, is probably reasonable to do recording and editing and everything with. Yeah, and I mean, exciting as well is just the, you know, when I was learning how to program for the web, you would open a page, view source, you know, see mm -hmm. the HTML, mm -hmm. you know, probably no CSS at that time, see all the table layouts, you know, <laughs> those kind of things, but as it went along by kind ah, of reading, good old days. reading other people's code, <laughs> and that idea that, you know, you're kind of just a JavaScript console away from like a fully programmable kind of audio environment. Mm -hmm. Just as an educational tool, I think is really powerful. I think a way of getting, you know, children into programming, or you know, maybe people who have a, a, an interest in audio but would like to do a bit of programming, or vice versa. You know, this kind of immediately accessible. It's there, and it, and you know, it's it's 
it's a full featured programming language in audio environment and yeah. there's not a lot you couldn't do given enough time and <laughs> you know, the advances with, with as usual today. although that is I mean we were talking earlier I think that is one of the challenges today is building user experiences is is hard whether it's in native or web for that matter but building the user experience is still sometimes a significant piece I mean like Paul's guitar tuner is uh, he, he has a much more intuitive feel for user experience than I do. So it looks beautiful, you know, it actually works and it's something that I can replace my guitar tuner with because it works just as well as a user. And yeah. whether, you know, technically or not is, is not really the issue. But then you have, you know, by, by putting it there in, in the web environment, you're, you're opening the field to such a huge number of people who are coming from lots of different backgrounds to, to do exactly. audio interfaces. Exactly. I think there's quite an interesting movement at the moment of using web audio and people's smartphones to, to do distributed performances. Mm -hmm. So either mm -hmm. having audience participation or using the, the phones as like a diffuse sort of array of loudspeakers all around the audience and distributing right. the sound. You know, it's no one needs any special equipment to do that, but mm -hmm. it's also making it's opening up the possibility of like interfaces for making music and sound to, to, to a huge number of people. Which Absolutely, you know, yeah. We'll push the boundaries in that, I think. It'll be interesting to see the first concert where that becomes a thing. Instead of holding your phone up, you know, just to show the screen like the old lighter thing, uh, you know, you'll actually be participating in creating the music. I think that's pretty actually totally possible today, yeah. um, given all of the, the features that we have. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, the fact that we've, we've pushed to get all of web audio onto mobile and have it work well in mobile is, is a, a huge piece of this. I mean, it, it, the fact that not only does my phone work well for mobile, but my tablet, my, my laptop, my desktop computer, my TV for that matter, um, you know, whatever I need as a surface uh, to interact with, it can be there. Yeah. And I think that's going to be a huge advantage for web audio and, and the web as a, a music production environment to me is getting a big screen up with a big display is actually quite easy, but connecting five of those together without the web as a collaborative environment can be quite hard. But I can easily stack you know, a couple of iPads next to each other and my, my Android phone and a TV and everything and have every member of the band have their own, you know, set list and, and music chart. Um, I mean, we're surrounded so. by sort of bits of props here, yeah. a few keyboards <laughs> and things. I mean, that's that's another really interesting hey, development. The, of this is this is a hardworking keyboard right here. <laughs> this is my workhorse. You know, my uh, one. But I, I mean, now now we can time. connect connect these. I mean, you were saying absolutely, that yeah. That was one of the things that you've seen that's really interesting with with how kind of. How Traditional yeah. kind of instrument yeah. manufacturers are embracing the web using web MIDI and web audio to sort of. I think between um, you know having devices like this that are, are an easy and obvious, much more intuitive controller. Um, you know the first thing that this actually was where web MIDI came from, is when I first saw web audio and looked at. Um, you know the the first question I asked myself as a, a synth geek from the eighties was can I build a synthesizer with this? And it turns out the answer is yeah, actually fairly simply. Um, and so I built this and then immediately I was like, wow, I can't stand using my computer keyboard to play music with. Like that's not, it's not a musical instrument to me. And the latency on touch input was problematic at the time and using a mouse to tap on screen keyboard, uh, don't even want to go there. Um, so I want to be able to plug a device like this in. You know, I have, I have piles of synthesizer keyboards at home and controllers. I want to be able to plug those in as well. So, you know, why can't we do that from the web? So I went and, and you know, made a proposal about web MIDI. Uh, got some people excited about building it um, internally in Chrome, and now it's now it's a thing. Uh, they're building it in, in Firefox today, and we'll, hopefully we'll see it in the other browsers as well. But I think that that idea of I can use whatever device is, is attached to my local, uh, my local keyboard. Like I don't see, this isn't going to be something that every um, web browser in the world has a MIDI device plugged into. But if I want to be working on music, likely the device I'm using has MIDI support. Yeah, exactly. Um, or, or audio, if not MIDI, in which case we need audio I.O. To, to work really well. The interesting thing about MIDI as well is it's not just we're not just taking the web platform back to the 80s. It's it's no, a really simple no. kind of a simple protocol. That yes, you know you can you can get a library for for an Arduino that will do MIDI, and suddenly you can connect exactly. a button into your web applications. Right? It's it yes. doesn't necessarily even need to be an audio application to have that 
bringing kind of hardware devices and connecting them yes. up to the platform. I mean, MIDI has a very simple uh, sort of protocol for the basics, you know, the controllers and, and uh, node on, node off messages. But then it has this massive, like, open ended expansion um, that it details what you can do or what the, the parameters of how to build your own custom things. And manufacturers have been going nuts with that for 30 years now. So, like, there's. There's plenty of extended uses of MIDI beyond that. Um, but, but the basics are still there. And the basics of, I want to be able to plug a controller in and play notes on a piano keyboard, that's quite a powerful thing. Or you know, I want to be able to plug in my drum pads and yeah. play in a beat very easily, or use the pads on that keyboard over there to play in a beat. That's, that's quite a, a powerful thing to be able to easily do. And for educational purposes as well, I think this is immense. Um, I've seen uh, a number of companies um, like Piano Marvel, I think, and, and uh, other ones, and, and notation software like NoteFlight, and you get these, um, these experiences where you can do um, training so much better when you have a computer connection. And anytime you do that, but you require a certain you know, operating system and configuration, and you have to put your laptop right next to your piano, and and hopefully it recognizes the notes or whatever. That's not a great experience for for students. And having been a piano student myself, um, you know, I know the hardest thing is you go off. Uh, you know, you have a lesson maybe once a week, and um, in the meantime, you just practice by yourself, and hopefully you're getting it right. But now, you know, software can actually watch that, and it can guide you even when you're not there with your instructor at the time. And it can say, hey, your timing is a little rough on this part, and here's how you need to correct it. Um, things that, you know, otherwise it you would have been practicing it wrong for a week, and then yeah. listening to your instructor say, nope, go back and do it again. Yeah. And uh, that, I think that kind of education is, is massively helpful. And at the same time, you know, screens and web browsing capabilities are, um, are, are essentially uh, widely available at this point. You know, I have multiple iPads and, and tablets and, um, and phones in my house. I can put any one of them up on my piano and use it as, a, as sheet music notation or, or a backing score even yeah. and have it play that, that for me. So I think that's pretty compelling. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I'm not so familiar with but you've talked to a lot of people about, I'm sure, is, is games. Like games is an where, interesting where, one. Where yeah. are we at with audio and Yeah, games. games is a really interesting one because I think that, you know, I remember back in like the late late 80s, early, I guess the early 90s more, um, there was a push to start using MIDI in games. This idea that you could provide really good quality music um, at a low bandwidth right. by using MIDI. And it turns out that wasn't a great idea because people don't have the same MIDI synthesizer. Even general MIDI, it's not identical and musicians, you really want to make sure that the bass drum does sound exactly like the bass drum you programmed, not some other rough approximation. Um, but the audio capabilities or the audio needs for gaming uh, is something that web audio was originally, it, it was very closely designed for that as well as for pro audio. Specifically when you have a game and um, you know, you you fire a laser in the game, you want to hear that pew, pew, pew sound, you know, right when the user hits the button, right, right when, when the gamer is, is expects it to, to happen. And this is something that HTML did not do well. Like, the web platform did not do well prior to this because it, the audio element and, and previous ways of playing audio, they wrapped up the stages of loading, decoding, and playing all together. And they weren't very precise. They didn't, you know, it, it didn't have this sort of sample accurate, okay, start playing the sound right now. And oh, by the way, I may have five copies of this sound or five sounds that are overlapping each other playing at the same time. And web audio gives you that really low level schedulable control, which is pretty powerful. I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of capabilities there that are, uh, are not yet fully utilized, but even the basics are so much easier. With web audio, and I think we're already seeing, we're already starting to reap the benefits of that in some places. And now that the, um, now that Microsoft is is shipping web audio support in their Edge browser, uh, release coming soon, I think, um, it's it's even better because now we have it across all of the the major browsers. Right. And you know the, 
that compatibility is a, a tremendous benefit. Yeah. So what else? What else is, is exciting? I mean, what else do you think is, uh, is upcoming that's going to be an interesting direction? I think what's perhaps slowing down the adoption from people who are currently working in kind of computer music or audio is maybe the fact that the Web Audio API isn't the same as what they're currently using. Mm -hmm. and so, so we've had we've had for quite a while an idea of running arbitrary audio processing code in what's called the script processor, but we're trying to move away from that because the model is kind right. of is not suitable Awful. for the purpose. <laughs> but but you uh, editors of the spec and those working around it, we're kind of looking for a way of doing that. And I think that's I think that's very interesting. I think it's you know speaking to to a few developers who are looking to see if they can, you know, effectively compile pure data or mm -hmm. C sound mm -hmm. kind of patches that perhaps they're using to write audio engines for, you know, iOS or Android applications and be able to reuse right. that code within th the platform. I mean, for me personally, it's a little bit sad because it breaks that view source thing. If <laughs> I go on the view source and I see just a load of, you know, a ASM load or of, web you know, assembly, gen or generating arrays of, right. of audio data. Right. It's a bit harder, but in terms of in terms of providing a platform where people will be able to start moving, this is something I've been I've been pushing the Web Audio Working Group on quite a bit recently. Has been that Web Audio is actually a specific way of doing audio processing, and we do have uh, the this way of inserting your own. I want really customized JavaScript processing in it. The the script processor that's getting replaced by something currently called Audio Worker. I'm not sure if it's going to keep that name or not. Um, but that will be much more efficient at enabling you to do that. But there's this whole spectrum of applications and experiences. Like I, Some people get surprised, particularly when I, I was editing the, the web audio spec for quite a while, that I'm not a DSP guy. Like uh, I don't intuitively understand how the FFT algorithm works or, you know, like I haven't uh, spent years in educating myself about um, all of digital signal processing, and at the same time, like web audio hits about the right level for me. Like I do intuitively understand how to plug these pieces together to get a synthesizer or a vocoder or whatever. Um, but there are people who want something completely different, and like one of the scenarios, for example, is um, arcade game emulation, where if you want to emulate a system that used to do eight kilobit, uh, eight eight kilohertz, uh, eight bit audio, you know, grafting that into web audio is actually quite hard. Yeah, um, it's not something that's easy to do today at all. Uh, and I think that we need to start looking at those sorts of scenarios of how you have lower level hooks into the audio system if that's what you really want. Yeah, and certainly script processor was a first kind of escape valve for that, but I think we're, we need to do more in that direction, too. So it'll be interesting to see where we can go. Yeah. I mean, I think for me and the people I talk to and the projects I see working, you know, the, the Venn diagram of people who can do JavaScript, people who yes. can do yes. computer music, you know, and people who can do the kind of web audio API, and that sort of intersection is really small at the moment, and kind of pushing the I barriers think it, of I that. think it is, yeah. I think the exciting part to me, too, is just seeing those people who can do JavaScript or people who are interested in learning to do JavaScript uh, grow into the music and audio space. And yeah. I still I get a tremendous number of people who contact me personally because of the demos that I've written or the the uh, you know the spec connection or or whatever, um, who are like, hey, I saw your you know audio recorder demo. I was just wondering, is it even possible to do X? And you know, I can reply back to them and say, yeah, that's totally possible. You probably want to look at this bit here. Um, go go play around with it for a while, because yeah. you know, I can't do everything, of course. Um, and I think seeing people get excited and start doing, start exploring those bits, even when they don't deeply understand them to start with, is, is pretty exciting, too. And I think that's going to grow the overall market and, and what we see come out. So I think that's going be, gonna to be exciting. Yeah. So what else? Anything, anything particularly on your mind as areas to uh, to watch in the future? I think an interesting area that hasn't hasn't fully developed yet is just 
collaborative tools for, for musicians. Absolutely. So, yeah. So I was, you know, use the analogy of you know when when Google Docs first appeared and you know, mm -hmm. being able to write a, a, a word processor in the browser and people said, well, like, it will never replace Microsoft Word for <laughs> me. Right? It doesn't have all of the things that I need. It doesn't. Right. But the fact that you could collaborate and chat alongside things and do those sort of th m meant that for a huge number of use cases, it kind of it moved there. And I think that's possibly what we'll start to see happening with Web Audio, that maybe it's going to be a long time until I can do all of my kind of music production in, yeah. in a single application yeah. in a browser. But if I just want to collaborate on a, you know, on a drum loop with, with some friends and try out a few patterns and right. then maybe say, what do you think about this? And oh, I think you should swap the kick drum out for a different sound or exactly. how about pushing I mean, the this, timing here? This is exactly and then maybe the we'll take that out and load it back into yeah. our environment. And yeah. I, I get so many people who, you know, they'll they'll ask the question of, so you know, I want to build this like real time collaboration system where I just uh, you know I pop up on the screen and my buddy across the country and I can jam together. Right. It's like, well, that's actually quite hard. I mean, like that there the network is simply not supportive of that. Like the latency that's inherent in TCP/IP networking from one end of the country to the other particularly if you've got a Wi-Fi link at each end, is, is probably going to make that untenable for many types of music, most types of music. But there are so many other types of collaboration that you can do that go back and forth and hook together. And if you look at like the real-time differences between that sort of playing and um, you know, doing music production, or doing even like uh, playing Ableton Live, you know, like that, that level of I'm going to hook things in, and I'm going to play just a bit before they need to be played, but the system keeps me on beat and everything. That actually is, is possible today with the tools that we have. And the collaboration system there is just immensely, immensely compelling. I think particularly when you add some elements of offline to that, where I can work on something, and maybe my buddy comes and picks it up, you know, my musical collaborator picks it up, uh, in half an hour or something like that. That's perfect. I think that's a really exciting place to go. So I think uh, with that, we're gonna we're gonna close up. Um, it was really exciting to talk to you. I'm glad we could sit down and have this chat. You too, Chris. It's good to see you in London. Thanks.